Today, most other animals are so utterly at our mercy that we wipe out about a dozen species a day, just as an unintentional byproduct of how we like to run things. Yeah, I think you don't even have to look at the animals. You can just think of other civilizations like colonialism and how we didn't exactly treat these people kindly and try to understand their culture and share solutions on how to survive in the universe. Hi everyone, this is Veronica and today I am back on my own with yet another video. The one I will be reacting to is by a guy whose name I cannot pronounce, I have tried, um, of camera. It's Kurzgesagt, I think, I think it's German, and um, please correct me if you can spell it out phonetically. I am hoping very much that he'll say his name at some point in the video because you guys suggested um, a few of his videos, so I will probably watch more, maybe by myself, maybe with Voldemort. And then the next time I could know how to pronounce his name. Uh, but yeah, anyway, the title of the video we'll be watching today, I will be watching today, <laughs> is uh, why we should not look for aliens, the dark forest. Um, and I am not very knowledgeable about science, but I am like a bit of an amateur enthusiast, I suppose. I guess you, yeah, that's what you could call it. I listen to some podcasts, I watch some videos from time to time, just as background noise, and I've read a fair bit of science fiction books, I've seen some movies, you know, so I know what the dark forest is. Um, I guess if you're watching this video, you will know as well, but um, from just so you know where I stand, I know that it's about uh, that there are different civilizations in the universe, but they are not. Uh, we don't know that they are there because they are silent, uh, because they are hiding, because they are not necessarily very friendly. Um, and I also, The Dark Forest makes me think of the second part of the Free Body Problem book, which I have read or listened to, I do not remember, but I remember liking it very much. It was very intricate on the science part of science fiction. Uh, so I recommend that if you haven't read it. I know there is a Netflix series right now, which I haven't seen, but I've also heard it's pretty good. Um, I don't know if it is or not, uh, but the book then is. Okay, so I think that's enough of an introduction. Uh, let's just... Crack on. The universe is incredibly big and seems full of potential for life, with billions of habitable planets. If an advanced civilization had the technology to travel between the stars at just 0.1% of the speed of light, it could colonize our galaxy in roughly 100 million years. Which is not that long given the billions of years the Milky Way has existed. So, in principle, any spacefaring civilization should be able to spread rapidly over huge sectors of the galaxy. And yet, we see nothing, hear nothing. The universe seems empty. I think this is called out. I stopped it to share knowledge, but I don't actually remember what it's called. But I think it's something with an F, like a F something paradox uh, with a name uh, that we are supposed to be aware of all these. I think that there has to be life, it seems, because there's other plants with water conditions similar to ours, yet we don't see any um, sign of it. And I think it's also to do with how much we emit into the space on purpose, like, you know, like the Beatles saw or whatever information we're putting out, uh, and also like radio waves because of our activity. Uh, but we are not picking up anything like that from the observable universe. Uh, I think this is what this is about. Maybe he'll say what it's what it's called that I shouldn't have stopped. Void of others. This is the Fermi paradox, which we've discussed in more detail in other videos. That is Confronted just like... with the seemingly empty universe, humanity faces a dilemma. We desperately want to know if we are alone in the Milky Way. We want to call out and reveal ourselves to anyone watching, but that could be the last thing we ever do because maybe the universe is not empty. Maybe it's full of civilizations, but they are hiding from each other. Maybe the civilizations that attracted attention in the past were wiped away by invisible arrows. This is the dark forest solution to the Fermi paradox. Wasn't that something like that in the Mass Effect games? I forgot what the guys were called, but the ancient civilizations that would wipe out the civilizations that were too advanced. Maybe something like that. Maybe they don't like our Beatles song and they would demolish our planet. Oh, he didn't say his name. Life. The hunter awakes in his hiding place, 
and carefully listens for suspicious noises from the thick undergrowth before he gets up. Another night has passed without incident. The forest is dark and full of fog. He considers calling out to others to end his loneliness, but stops himself at the last moment. What if they are like him? All living things seek to survive, secure resources, and multiply. Their greatest obstacle are other living things that share the same objective. Competition between species favored the survival of beings with advantageous traits. Our ancestors were inventive, competitive, expansionist, and greedy for resources, which led them to winning the competition for our planet. Today, most other animals are so utterly at our mercy that we wipe out about a dozen species a day, just as an unintentional byproduct of how we like to run things. Yeah, I think you don't even have to look at the animals. You can just think of other civilizations like colonialism and how we didn't exactly treat these people kindly and try to understand their culture and share solutions on how to survive in the universe. But humans are more than individuals. From us, cultures emerge that also compete with each other. Competitive and expansionary cultures spread faster and further and merge with, subdue or destroy others. If we look at our history, it becomes clear we are dangerous. Not just to others, but also to ourselves. Our human nature has driven us to take over every corner of our planet and soon we will look to the stars, both to expand our domain and ensure access to ever more resources. And then we might stumble upon others trying to do the same thing. It's likely that the competition of life also takes place on faraway planets, so it's logical to assume that an alien civilization that came to dominate their planet would be in some regards similar to us. But if they're similar to us, they too may be dangerous. The implication. As the hunter sneaks through the dark forest all alone, he knows that there might be others like him. He can't know their intentions, if they are aggressive or not. I just wanted to say that I'm really enjoying the animation and the way he explains it. It's explained in a very simple way. Uh, and then the music in the background, it gives a little bit of a chilly vibes. Really nice. The hunter knows he would kill to ensure his own survival, so he has to assume that they would too. And it might be that if he stumbles upon another hunter, the one that shoots first survives. None of this means that conflict is unavoidable. So far, the progress of the modern world seems to have made us more peaceful, not more violent. Maybe this is true for other civilizations too, that eventually progress means less conflict, not more. Different alien civilizations also should vary from the mild and peaceful to the malevolent and militaristic. The existential problem we're facing is that when we meet others between the stars, we have no way of telling who is peaceful or aggressive and what their true intentions are. Similarly, they might not understand or trust our intentions, even if we tell them that we are peaceful. On top of that, if we did discover another civilization and they discovered us, the light years between us would mean years of communication delay. Both sides would be in a state of uncertainty, wondering if the wisest move is to just attack because there's another serious issue, technological explosions and the first strike advantage. We don't know where the limits of technology are, but we do know how much technological progress matters in war. A few hundred or thousand years can turn conflict with uncertain results into a one-sided massacre. Caesar's legions would stand no chance against Napoleon's army with their cannons and muskets, which would be eradicated by artillery from the First World War, which would not stand a chance against today's drones and guided missiles. So the power level of different civilizations may vary massively, and even if not, between the time it takes us to detect another civilization and us saying hi, we might already be hopelessly behind on the tech tree. Which is bad enough, but the nature of interstellar conflict makes this worse. Yeah, I mean, one thing is the, um, the weapons that they would have, but another thing is that we may not even be able to comprehend how they would, like he said before, like what they 
how they speak or they have half movies about this or like books like, I don't know, the Ender's Game when they have this hive mind, so they communicate in a different way. We don't know. We don't know if these beings would be like carbon-based like us. Would they be similar at all? And then what kind of technology they would have? Maybe there would be no competition, like not even in the same category, like between Caesar and Bonaparte. We don't know that, I guess. But yeah, he's uh, really explaining that very visually. If your opponent is light years away, sending an invasion fleet takes so long that by the time it arrives, it might be hopelessly obsolete. Yeah. So war between civilizations might be just about eliminating the other to remove an existential threat to yourself. Someone else who might be so scared of you that they attack the first chance they get. In this environment, the only way to guarantee a win is to strike with such force and speed that the target has no chance of survival or time to counterattack or escape to seek revenge later. The stakes are the highest possible, with no room for error. If we assume that the majority of civilizations live on planets, that leaves them pretty vulnerable. All you need to do is throw something massive at a planet to make it uninhabitable. So the ultimate interplanetary annihilation weapon is probably something like a relativistic kill vehicle. A missile shot at a planet at a significant fraction of the speed of light. So like in Star Wars though? For example, a missile the size of a person going 95% the speed of light has as much energy as all nuclear bombs on Earth. If you shot a few dozen at the civilization you wanted to wipe out, success would be fairly certain even a single hit would suffice. Unless they have shields. This is not that absurd of an idea. A civilization only slightly above us on the Kardashev scale would have enough energy to send multiple strikes against every planet it suspects of harboring life. What makes these weapons so sinister is how much they favor a first strike, since they would be so fast that it might be impossible to protect yourself effectively against them once they're launched. Conflict between civilizations may not be lengthy affairs, but rapid winner-takes-all situations, where the first one to shoot wins. This makes any civilization an existential threat to any other. And if every civilization is an existential threat to every other, there may be only two kinds of civilizations out there. Quiet ones and dead ones. So, what should we do? Should we worry? It's unlikely that anybody has noticed humanity yet. The radio signals we've transmitted in the last 100 years traveled a relatively tiny distance and have long decayed into unreadable noise. At right. our technological stage, if we don't actively try to get noticed, and if nobody specifically looks at our pretty unremarkable solar system, we'll stay hidden. But one day we will venture into space in a serious way and need to consider these kinds of questions again. We don't know if there are others or if we are going through the forest alone. But we have no way of knowing for sure. For the time being, it seems the best we can do is to carefully listen. And even if we see others step into a clearing and make themselves known, we should not reply right away, but carefully watch them from the undergrowth. Perhaps we are also thinking about this all wrong by allowing our primitive brain that evolved in the context of the gruesome competition of life to conjure fears of predatory aliens all around us. Maybe the fact that we are looking at the universe like this is a sign that we are not grown up yet as a species. There could be a friendly, welcoming community of alien civilizations waiting to hear from us when we are ready. Yeah, it's kind of like what he said. Maybe the more advanced we are, the more peaceful we are. And we are still too close to the stage where we were so worried about survival uh, in our, you know, reptilian brains. Like he said, maybe we're not grown enough to think about it. That's an interesting way to put it. As for now, the good news is there is actually little we need to do. We just need to be thoughtful about the signals we send out into the galaxy. We need to watch the sky and learn more about our galaxy, our forest. Because whatever the nature of our forest is, full of dangers or friends or nobody at all, only careful observation can tell. So, let's do that. At last, the hunter reaches a clearing and finds a comfortable position. Slowly, the sun melts the fog away. Lost in thought, he admires the vegetation until suddenly 
he is eye to eye with another hunter, frozen in terror, just like himself. His mind is racing, considering all the different options. The hunter takes a deep breath and makes a decision. Maybe the only way out of the dark forest is to step into the clearing together. Okay, well, that animation was just gorgeous. I really liked it. I'm gonna watch it again, I think, <laughs> uh, just to have a little look at the animation. I don't know if I've learned anything that new from this video, but it was definitely knowledge very well organized, which is always good. It's always good to organize the knowledge that you have. So I really enjoy that. I've seen that this guy has a lot of different videos. Uh, and some of the subjects that I have no idea about, so I would love to watch some more. Please let me know if you liked it and if you'd like me to. Um, yeah, but so far, thanks for watching with me. Uh, I think this is really something, uh, not really for us small grey people to think about. Uh, and I think there's no need to get too existentially terrified uh, about the possibilities like that. But at the same time, it's really fascinating to think about. Um, I think we either are really scared of the abstract concept that we cannot imagine, or we're really fascinated by them, or both things at the same time, which results in, you know, in the scary science fiction movies or in a little bit of existential dread before bed. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed how he explained all of that. Thank you for watching with me. And if you enjoyed it as well, then please um, give me a like. You can leave a subscribe to our channel. It helps us a lot. And you can also leave a comment. Uh, if you're also into science fiction, please, if you'd like to let me know, let me know what books you like. Maybe recommend something to me that I haven't read. Uh, it's always a subject that I like, uh, both science and science fiction. Okay, thanks very much, guys, and see you in the next video. Bye.